Let's uh, give a warm welcome to Scott Francher. He's the uh, SVP for Boeing. Thank you. We're going to have a 20-minute uh, interview, very much like we did uh, earlier in the session. And our title is interesting because it's called Transformational Ideas in the Age of Disruption. It was the same theme that we had in the uh, roundtable discussion there. Uh, and this is the right company at the right time to, to have the discussion because uh, 2016, Boeing was celebrating its 100 years in existence as a group. Uh, I recall actually doing a documentary back in 2003 on 100 years of flight. So let's think about what happened in the first century. We'll take a peek what's going to happen in the next century. But we've been talking about that 2030 <laughs> timeline here in terms of ground transportation, what's been transformational, what are the targets for the UAE in that sort of space. Let's take a peek at what's going to likely happen to 2030. We've seen what's happened in the last two decades alone with the development uh, of the Gulf carriers and uh, serving as a bridge between east and west right. and moving right into Africa. We've had a, a good long discussion behind the scenes, so we're out to provide as much information uh, and insight to where we are today. Uh, you know, it's fascinating. You look at uh, driverless cars and artificial intelligence, what's happening on the ground. But we're not expecting a great revolution when it comes to airline travel, but more efficient travel, a better customer, customer experience. What do you think is going to be the, the biggest impact from now to 2030, would you suggest, Scott? So I, I think it, it'll take a couple of different forms. Um, one is providing ever more economical airplanes and services to our customers so that we can enable their business models for growth. Now, that'll manifest itself as continuously improving fuel efficiency. Mm -hmm. The current generation of, of airplanes that we're developing are all 20% more fuel efficient than the ones that we're replacing. You know, and that's a combination of, of material systems, uh, systems themselves, propulsion uh, from, uh, from GE and Rolls and others, uh, all combining together for, for airplanes that are just much more efficient to operate also more efficient to maintain. A uh, great example is the 787-10, which will fly hopefully on Friday in Charleston for the first time. That airplane is over 96% common with the 787-9 in parts, what it takes for us to produce the airplane, and what it takes for airlines to maintain the airplane. So a convergence of these technologies focused on improved operating efficiency is going to be key going forward. Now, bigger is not necessarily better now. I mean, you're almost, if you will, trying to find the sweet spot in terms of the size of the plane. You have the Dreamliner on the market, sales of better than 1,100 planes. Uh, what is the sweet spot for industry now as the world gets smaller, would you suggest? What's the market need? And that's your number one priority, let's be honest. Well, it really is. And it's, it's a thing that we spend an awful lot of intellectual bandwidth on, trying to understand where the market is heading so that we can create products that will really service those needs. Now, there's a well-established uh, demand in single-aisle airplanes, 737-class uh, uh, airplanes. We expect that demand to continue to grow. Uh, in the wide bodies, the 787, the 777 size airplanes, really great demand out there. But the airplanes that are much larger than that, we've seen a lot less demand uh, over the last 10 years and declining demand over the last 10 years. So you'll see us concentrate, I think, in that range of seat count. We'll always be looking for whether or not there's a convergence of new technologies, evolving markets, and the economics to open up uh, new market segments for us. Uh, we've been looking at a potential new middle-of-the-market airplane uh, and testing our hypotheses uh, along those lines. Uh, and it'll continuously evolve. I mean, our view of the market 10 years ago is different than it is today, and it'll be different again in 10 years. But isn't that the heart of our conversation? You work in a long-cycle business that has to constantly adapt. How do you do that and try to introduce new product that your customer wants, engage it right. Yeah, it, it really gets us into what may be the most exciting thing happening in our business today, and that is a convergence of a long cycle business, very capital intensive to develop um, new aircraft and engines. Uh, it takes a long time to do so, largely because of the, or partially because of the regulatory environments, but also because these are very complex machines to develop. 
But on the other hand, you've seen new technology, we're seeing new technologies come online. Uh, we talked about additive in the last session. Um, talk about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the ability to embed that not just into our products, but our production systems as well. Mm -hmm. Much more highly integrated production systems that, uh, that span not just what occurs within our four walls, but within our supply chain as well. Mm -hmm. A digitally enabled, distributed production system. All of these things are uh, converging in a way that should allow us to start to shorten uh, development times for new products. A great example is uh, an airplane that we flew not just, uh, or just recently, uh, in St. Louis in our military business. It's a candidate for the Air Force's new uh, trainer requirement. And we went from initial design to flying the airplane in two years. Wow. Using many of the technologies that we're talking well, about. What's the normal cycle for something like that? An airplane that size would have taken quite a bit longer, oh. maybe twice as long. Good. How do you apply that to the strata manufacturing experience that we have in Alain here? Uh, you started kind of with a very clear, narrow focus, but it's building, right, with the capabilities here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we began uh, the relationship several years ago with the placement initially of some 787 and 777 parts. Now, these aren't big, complex parts, but they're great parts to begin to understand what it means to manufacture in an aerospace environment. And the folks down there have just done a great job of bringing that factory online, producing high quality parts on time, huh. which is one of the things we value most in our supplier partners. Um, we have plans to expand the relationship. Uh, next will be the vertical fin for the 787 where we'll, we plan on having uh, half of the production capability uh, reside there. Uh, and that's a large complex aerostructure. So once the team there demonstrates the ability to build an aerostructure that large and that complex, well, there'll be a, a world-class aerostructures uh, provider, and we're really looking forward to that. But it's not just about manufacturing. Our relationship with the folks there extends into engineering, and we have some joint R&D projects going on as well. So our strategy is very simple. Start with a foothold that has a well-established need and a large backlog, so we have a stable demand for the team to build on and then expand the relationship into these other dimensions. Good. I had an interview with uh, Sir Tim Clark last week covering a range of issues, including that uh, electronics ban, which is another category to itself. But there's somewhat of a thought that these Gulf carriers in particular invested so heavily on long-haul flights and that the market's changing. We're not going to get a, a shock where they cancel the big uh, planes, the uh, 787s, the 777s, the A380s in mass and have to rethink the business model? Well, we certainly hope not, and we don't think so. Um, but maybe a little bit of perspective around that. Um, if you think about where we're located here in the Gulf, 80% uh, of the world's population lives within eight hours of where we're at. That geography is not going to change, and those demographics are going to continue uh, to expand. So it's a great location for the business model that the Gulf carriers have deployed, that hub-and-spoke mm. uh, business model. Uh, the other thing, if, if we look at uh, worldwide demand for airline traffic, it grows at about 2% above world uh, gross domestic product or world GDP. Every year, year in, Every year, year, out, with year, some year fluctuations. in, year out. And there'll be fluctuations year to year, but the fluctuations typically aren't that great. Uh, certainly it responds to exogenous shocks, um, but over time that average is held very well. So you're looking at a region that has great geography for the business model that's deployed, and uh, macroeconomic trends that should produce continuously increasing demand. Now, um, the capacity in the marketplace sometimes doesn't track that demand. And when you get an imbalance, an adjustment is needed. But over the long haul, we think this is going to be a great marketplace uh, for commercial aviation, and we think the Gulf carriers have great business models. Hmm. You've been in uh, Boeing for 40 years, so 40 of its 100 years in existence. You graduated and went straight into the program, and you have a CEO in Dennis Mullenberg who says, I'm not looking for moonshots, but should we spend five minutes thinking what is a moonshot in air travel today? Uh, you're saying supersonic travel is too expensive? Uh, to deploy into the marketplace? Yeah, well, uh, supersonic travel is a great example. Of, you know, could we build a commercial supersonic airliner? Absolutely, we could. Can it be operated economically by airlines and deployed in a business model that allows them 
uh, to create growth. We're not so sure. The economics and the physics of operating an aircraft, a commercial aircraft at supersonic speeds, is pretty darn difficult. And we don't see any major changes in technology that are going to enable that anytime mm -hmm. soon. Now, having said that... What makes it a, difficult to, for those who don't know the dynamics of air travel? Well, it's just the amount of energy it takes to get to that speed uh, for that long a period of time. Huh makes it un uneconomical, basically. There are certain other practical limitations as well. I mean, if you think about the world airways, they're like highways, except airplanes don't pass each other. So everybody's got to kind of fly at the same <laughs> speed. So if you deploy a, a new super fast airplane, it's got to fly over everybody, which again complicates the, the dynamic of the, the situation. Uh, now, having said that, we're constantly looking for disruptive influences. Mm. Uh, we have teams that are constantly looking and pressure testing, uh, is the model changing? And we don't look just within um, aviation and aerospace. We'll look at what's going on in the automotive regime. We'll look at what's going on with the information technology companies. Uh, AI is a great example. The application of AI to this, business, to this market is going to be um, wide reaching. And it's going to be not just around the products that we produce, but the production systems we use to produce them with. So a great example of a technology that we brought in and are examining and deploying um, that really didn't originate in aerospace by any means, but it's going to have a huge implications for it. Fascinating. Uh, let's talk about the 787. It's a project you worked on, uh, dubbed the Dreamliner, composite uh, aircraft. You went into it thinking extremely differently. You said it's not a product of engineers, but a, a completely outside the box. What were you trying to get accomplished here? Well, we really wanted to um, disrupt the marketplace. And we wanted to do it through a convergence of evolving technologies around material systems, around avionic systems, and around propulsion, and bring them all together in a way that would create an airplane that was 20% more fuel efficient than the airplane it was going to uh, replace. Uh, and you know we succeeded in doing that, quite frankly. The, the airplane today is deployed around the world, great fleet size here in the, uh, amongst the Gulf carriers. And it's enabled over 130 new routes around the world. So that's growth for airlines hmm. that weren't economical to do before. The other thing we wanted to do, though, is create a new experience for the passenger. If you think about it, airline travel for the passenger really hadn't changed that much, especially since the advent of the jet age. So we spent quite a bit of time understanding what passengers would value in the flying experience. And it really revolved around a couple things. One was um, to create a cabin environment that felt open and spacious. And we did that through the geometries used uh, in the cabin, the overhead bins and the, the sidewall structures. We also created an airplane with much larger windows so it would feel more spacious on the inside. And we, we played a little bit of a trick, too, studying the physiology of how people react to, to interior geometries. We placed the windows so that everybody in the airplane could see the horizon. Now, this will be kind of counterintuitive, but if you're in an airplane and you can see the horizon, it has the effect of making the interior seem larger. Uh, in addition to that, we, we designed the airplane with a lower cabin altitude, so people would feel more refreshed after a long haul flight. And uh, I tell you, if I don't know how many of you have flown on the 787, I, I will admit it's close to my heart, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing experience. I, I remember the, when, I, when I took over the, the program, and it was in, in, in some difficulty at the time. Uh, I'm just an engineer. They talked to me about all this physiology stuff, and I thought, well, that's very interesting, but we've got an airplane to finish designing and certifying. And, getting into production, and, and I didn't pay much attention to all of it until I flew the first, my first long-haul revenue flight. It happened to be from uh, Tokyo to Seattle, and I walked off that airplane and went straight to work. Oh, I felt, felt great. Much I felt great. Huh. Uh, a month earlier, I'd flown that on a, uh, another airplane and had to go home and take a nap and refresh. And yes. So, I mean, it really did make a difference. Good. So you you touched experience. upon it. Let's dig into it a little bit. You took over a project that had, what, it was a battery problems and teething problems getting off the production line. What is that, because this is a manufacturing uh, and industrialization summit, what does that do to a large structure like Boeing? Is it a panic, or do they say, I'm going to put Scott on, he's a member of the executive <laughs> council, go do some firefighting? What actually happens in the production line? Well, um, I, I guess the best way to 
to describe it is intense focus. Um, there was never a moment of panic. Um, we applied the right resources, the right talent. We analyzed what the challenges were, and then we attacked the challenges. Uh, we had to do it in parallel. There were a number of challenges we had to deal with at once. So it created uh, quite a bit of bandwidth, uh, or, or needed quite a bit of bandwidth. Uh, we pulled together a leadership team. It was just absolutely fantastic. And they worked together as a team. So it was, it was almost a crisis unit, the firefighter? Uh, I wouldn't call it that. It was a collection of individuals, some of which had already been on the program, others we brought onto the program. Uh, we partnered. Um, with our uh, propulsion partners at, at GE and, and at uh, Rolls-Royce. Uh, Mohammed was up here a little while ago. He was, he was part of the, the team that helped uh, on that program. We also partnered with our supply chain because the producibility issues that we were dealing with weren't just inside our own four walls, but with our partners as well. Huh. So. And what do you tell customers during that time frame? Um, they, were they believers in the product and you wrote out the storm? You know, I think uh, that's a good way to describe it. Now, we broke um, a lot of promises and uh, didn't meet a lot of expectations. And, and the best thing um, that we could do with customers is to be open and transparent with not only where we were, but what we were doing about it. Huh. Uh, but our customers had participated in the design. They understood what the potential for the airplane was. Uh, they saw that the physics of it were, was going to work, um, and they knew that it would uh, have a positive impact on their business models. So, and, and what uh, did you prove with, with the um, with the composite uh, materials? Then it, it's something that's going to be duplicated from uh, this point forward. Or yeah, no? I think you're going to see uh, continuously widespread use of composite materials um, in aviation. Um, you're going to see rapid expansion of additive manufacturing, that was the point of the previous, previous discussion, uh, rapid expansion of additive manufacturing um, in the airplanes uh, going forward, largely with structure that doesn't carry a lot of load, interior pieces initially, and eventually once we work out the regulatory um, concerns around a new manufacturing process, which you always have, we'll uh, see it expand even more. Okay, you told me a very interesting figure I think it's worth planting for our audience. 90% of the world's population hasn't traveled Has, yet. Correct. That's, so everybody right. talks about saturation of a market. What yeah. happens here? So because the next 50 years could be explosive, and then we'll wrap that's, it up. That's exactly right. It's that, that trend of GDP growth and seat mile growth. And yeah, 90% of the world's population hasn't flown. What a great potential market around the world. Good. We're really excited about it. It's nice to see you. Uh, welcome Thank back you. to the Middle East. Uh, nice round of applause for our uh, guest here, Scott Francher, the SVP of Boeing. Thank you.